Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Matthias, I don't think I've seen you in a while, so nice to see you. We have a couple new people here, Patrick and Ben. So everyone make sure to say hi to Patrick and Ben at some point this morning. Nice to have you guys here. This morning, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk I think I have a talk with a similar kind of title, but anyhow, this is called My Way, Your Way, Any Way, Every Way. Um, and the talk was actually inspired by some Stephen Wright jokes that I heard uh, a while ago. I was a, a stand-up comedian. Most of you know that I did that for a while. And Stephen Wright was one of my, my uh, gods. <laughs> I just thought he was brilliant. And in fact, for a little while, I was writing stuff that was maybe a little too similar to Stephen Wright. Um, but if you don't know who he is, he's a guy, you might know this joke. He told, he said, uh, I went to a restaurant that serves breakfast at any time. So I ordered French toast during the Renaissance. <laughs> I've got some other jokes just to remind you. Uh, he says, what happens if you get scared half to death twice? <laughs> Why isn't the word phonetically spelled with an F? <laughs> Why don't they make the whole plane out of that black box stuff? A clear conscience is usually a sign of a bad memory. What's another word for thesaurus? This is one of my favorites. I intend to live forever. So far, so good. Borrow money from pessimists. They don't expect it back. When everything is coming your way, you're in the wrong lane. And actually, I'm going to destroy that last joke. <laughs> I'm going to ruin it because this is what my talk is based on. As I was going through his jokes, I realized there was actually a lot of wisdom in the silliness of what he's expressing. And when everything is coming your way, you're in the wrong lane, that just stuck with me. It really just stuck with me. Because when everything's coming your way, there's something about that phrase already that just is interesting to me. There's a lot going on there. And, uh, you know, when we think of uh, when everything's coming your way, it seems to suggest good fortune, you know, that uh, uh, the world is... As a character in The Simpsons put it, if you know The Simpsons, you know Bart's friend Milhouse. I remember Milhouse once say, saying, the world is coming up Milhouse, <laughs> you know, and that everything's coming your way is that same sort of idea that everything's just kind of going your way. But then as Stephen Wright suggests, well, if that's the way you feel, then you're in the wrong lane. And that's what kind of brings me up because there's something there. I know there's something there. I know he's talking about if you're driving your car, you know, in, in this lane, everybody's coming toward you and you're in the wrong lane, but he's also suggesting some other stuff here. And it's, if everything seems to be going your way, you're in the wrong lane. Now, why would that be? Why would you be in the wrong lane? If everything's coming your way, it seems like that'd be the lane you'd want to be in. But if you think about it, that's a, it's a very one-sided way of viewing our experience. It's a very one-sided way of viewing it. So we're, we're seeing things this way, which is everything's coming my way rather than any other way. Right? We're missing the entirety of our experience that's showing up, which then leads us to ask, do we really mean everything? Everything's coming our way. When we're saying everything's coming our way, you know we're already selectively editing out the stuff that's not going our way. And so in doing that, we're impoverishing our experience, we're reducing it. Because I would say, with, if we were to say everything's coming, coming my way, do we mean even the stuff we don't want? Is that what we mean? And yet, isn't the fact that life shows up the way we want it to and it shows up the way we don't want it to, that things happen that we love and things happen that we don't love so much, isn't that the abundance of life. Isn't that it? And for the things that we love to really pop, don't we need the other side of it, the things that we don't love? 
to show up. And we could say vice versa as well. And aren't we sometimes, and I'll say this is often at a later time, usually it's at a much later time, grateful for what we didn't want. Can you think of those times in your life where you'd gone through something and you just thought, oh, mm -mm, this is terrible. And then afterwards, something came from it. And you're grateful, even though it hurt so much at the time that you went through it. You know, every weekend, every weekend, every Sunday, we have that camera on. And those of you who are sitting here, you can't see, but there are a whole bunch of people online right now watching. As many people as there are here, at least, if not more, watching this talk. And we, wait, I didn't know what Zoom was before COVID hit. And COVID, we remember that was a pretty unsettling time. It was very unsettling. I was just talking about that again last night. When the lockdown happened, uh, part of me was like, everything's coming up, Steve. Because <laughs> I could just isolate and you know really not have to deal with other people or so I thought, right? But somebody reminded me that there was a great deal of uncertainty just in the lockdown. And of course, then there are people who were getting sick and dying and we lost a lot of people. And yet what came out of it was our ability to connect. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that, you know, that they were able to reconnect with people by reaching out through that suffering. And so, yeah, we discovered Zoom and now we have our community is enriched and enlarged, enlarged because of that. And so not only do we have those moments we go through that were painful for us, in which we suffered and we're grateful, but then we can also think of those times when we suffer from a surfeit of what we think we want, <laughs> when we just get too much of it. So think about Halloween. Oh boy, there's a point in my life when I remember Halloween was just like the best thing. You get all that candy. We didn't get too much candy when I was growing up as a kid. My mom would bake stuff. So it wasn't that we were, you know, living a life of, of, uh, of abstinence or anything like that. We had plenty of sugar, but it would be mom's baked cookies and stuff. So that junky candy, you know, we didn't really get that. So get that on Halloween. It's like, oh, I don't know what this is, but this is going to be good. And of course, then you'd eat some of it and you'd be like, meh, <laughs> it tasted kind of weird. But you just keep eating and you eat so much that you end up not feeling so well, right? So you can get a surfeit of what you love. I was just talking recently uh, on the discussion group on Wednesday nights about how I used to get those Girl Scout Thin Mints when I was in college. I knew somebody who had a daughter and I would, you know, they came in those separate packages. I would just eat one of those whole packages in one sitting. <laughs> you eat a couple and you go, ah, oh, it's really good. And they're so thin. You know what I mean? You just keep eating. And then you finally get to the end of it and you go, I do not feel very good right now. <laughs> right. So Everything's coming my way. What are we talking about? So this good fortune we're talking about, we can see that seemingly this good fortune can lead to more suffering for us and seemingly suffering incidents can actually bring about things that seem like they're fortunate for us. So the things that we call good fortune is that's just a limited, inaccurate way of describing what's happening right now. And it's no more than that. It's really all it is. We think good fortune really has something. <laughs> we can point to it. And it's really just a way we have of packaging up our experience. And by packaging it up, we're going to leave stuff out. After all, as Stephen Wright also says, you can't have everything. Where would you put it? <laughs> so wanting everything or everything coming our way is unrealistic. And then you might go, well, of course I realize that. I don't expect everything to come my way. But I would ask you, don't you? Really? Wouldn't you prefer it to be all good fortune and not the opposite? Wouldn't you rather avoid the pain and suffering? Ask yourself that. Now, for me, when I hear everything's coming your way, uh, I tend to see uh, a cloud in every silver lining. So... When I hear that everything's coming my way, 
might also mean to me that I'm being constantly assailed by what I don't like. So that was what kind of caught me about Stephen Wright's phrase as well, is that everything's coming my way. To me, it could also suggest nothing goes right. Everything I touch goes to ruin, right? Woe is me, right? And that's also a single-minded view, a single-minded take. And we can see how doing that can really affect us and what we think of ourselves. And what we think of ourselves is important in how it is that we interact with others. So I think about when I was a teacher, uh, I would get these student evaluations. And uh, I mean, students could go ahead and praise me all they wanted to, but the ones I remembered were the ones that were really nasty. And I talked to other teachers and they're kind of the same way. Those are the ones that just stick out, just, just pop right out at you and you just say, huh, I guess that semester was a disaster. You try not to, you try to go, well, that student like this, but if you've ever had student evaluations, what you really learn is that good, bad, who can really say? <laughs> so you'll have students, some students say, I really like the way that Mr. Matushak engages students in conversation. And then the next one would say, I really thought Mr. Matushak had no idea on how to engage students in the conversation. But you just, it's so easy to look over the compliments for the sour stuff. Or maybe you can imagine throwing a party and somebody doesn't show up to your party. And you've got all these dear friends around you, but that one person that didn't show up, it's just sticking in your mind. Right? You're kind of going, did I do something wrong? Some reason they're not here? Did I say something? Did I do something? Or maybe even it's a friend that you keep inviting <laughs> to parties and they don't show up. And you go, well, what's going on with this person? The last time I'm going to invite them to a party. Every time I invite them to a party, they don't show up. And in the meantime, you're missing all the people you love who are right there. And then you find out, perhaps, this is possible, that the person that you were dwelling on and criticizing in your mind had a flat tire as they were coming to your party. And this is the part you won't believe, but and they forgot to bring their phone with them. <laughs> and I say that because I had to lead a discussion group here once on a Wednesday evening, and uh, that's precisely what happened to me. I got to a certain point, I had a flat tire, and first I was ascertaining that I had a flat tire. And then once I'd ascertained that, then I found out that and I, I looked, looked at my clock on my phone, by the way, I had a phone with me and I went, oh, I have time to change this uh, tire. I'll just call somebody at Dharma Field and tell them that I'll be late. And that's when I realized at that point, I had just purchased a new phone and I had transferred everything onto my new phone and I had my old phone with me. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, I have no way of calling Dharma Field. So I better get going on that tire. And then guess what happened? I couldn't get it off. I could not get that tire off. I did everything in my power to get it off. And I just went, no, you know, so it happens. Or maybe the person who wasn't at the party had to uh, take somebody to an emergency room or had an emergency themselves. We don't really know. Because while we're caught up looking at one side or the other, we're caught up looking at one side or the other. We're picking this up and this becomes our whole, say, universe. Right? It becomes everything that we see. It's just that thing that we're looking at. And so what we're doing is we're getting stuck in a dualistic way of looking at the world, of seeing the world, this dualistic world of this, that, good and bad, right and wrong, you and I, right? This is the way that we tend to see the world. It's how we tend to see it. Good luck not doing that, right? So look at, uh, now this is one I don't quite understand, but uh, good luck looking at a pizza that has pineapple on it and saying that looks delicious to me. Now I picked that one because I know a lot of people, that was their, at least when I was young, that was their the stick, they would, they would draw a line and go, ah, no pineapple, pizza does not, it should not have pineapple on it. And I would have agreed with that. But now I eat pizza that has all kinds of weird things on it <laughs> that I would normally not. Corn? Corn on pizza? I don't know if you've ever had the elote at Pizza Luce, but if you haven't, it's fantastic. But, you know, like weird stuff like that. So now that doesn't even bother me. But for some people, that's it. Still to this day. 
pineapple <laughs> that crosses the line. But we do that all the time. We just kind of look at things and either there are things that we like or things that we don't like. We definitely tend to break the world up into you and me. So we tend to see the world dualistically. So I'm not going to suggest that we shouldn't see the world dualistically. It's just how we see it. But I do invite you to notice that we do so. Because that's where we get caught. That's where we pick those things up and that becomes everything we see. And we're missing out on the fact that we're just picking something up and looking at one side of it. We're missing out on that. So the invitation is when we're doing this, and we do this all the time, is just to realize that's what you're doing. To notice that when we do that, good or bad, you or me, whatever it is, it's actually just one side of the same coin. Okay. You flip a coin. Okay. Heads. The world is heads. Flip a coin. Tails. The world is tails. Sometimes we want heads, we get heads. Sometimes we want tails, we get tails. Sometimes we want heads, we get tails. Sometimes we want tails, we get heads. It keeps going like that. But in our anticipation, and our reaction, we lose sight of the fact that heads are tails. It's always the same coin. Always the same coin. Things that, be, that seem to be coming our way, Sometimes good fortune, sometimes it's bad fortune. And somebody asked me what my talk was going to be about last night. I was visiting some friends, and then as we were leaving, my husband told everybody, Oh, Steve's giving a talk tomorrow. And somebody asked me, you know, who I just met. So, and she said, Well, what's your talk about? And I remember I just kind of sat there and everybody laughed. And they go, Well, it looks like you need to work on uh, preparing your talk. And I just thought, how do I tell them in a nutshell <laughs> what this is that I'm going to be talking about, right? And and eventually I just started to, I tried to give a, like a quick overview. As somebody said, thanks for the preview, you know. Um, but that was one of the things that that I really was trying to help them to see. Sometimes good fortune, sometimes bad fortune, but it's always just this. It's always just this. And that one took a little while to sink it. So wait a minute, are you saying, and I'm thinking, we were leaving, I have to get home to sleep. But, um, but there you go. So I stayed and I tried to help with, you know, the circumstances with what it required of me. So, so when we're thinking about things always coming my way, obviously that's uh, a one-sided way of seeing things. But one of the things we're missing when we go, okay, Things are coming my way. It's good. Things are coming my way. It's bad. I understand what you're saying. Now I'm just going to say, it's all things coming my way. That's what it sounds like anyhow. When everything's coming your way, it's in the, you're in the wrong lane. Well, that opens up another way that that's just another one-sided view. Because think about this. It's all coming my way. Or bad things are coming my way. Good things are coming my way. It's all about me. When that's our formula, that's the way we've constructed the world. It's all about me. So when we're looking at it like in a good way, we can see that you know things are coming my way. It's all about me. Maybe we want to take credit for the good things that are coming my way. I deserve this. I made this happen. Uh, the joke that I tell from The Simpsons from time to time, because I really love this, was in Homer Simpson, was, I think it was when he was skipping going to church. And he was lying on his couch and he had a peanut. And it, he opened it up and there were two peanuts in one of the pods in the peanut. And he goes, Marge, look what I did. <laughs> you know, So we might take credit for what is showing up, whether we deserve it or not. And usually we take too, we give ourselves too much credit. Or we might say, I don't know if I deserve it, but what luck? You know, look what I get. Or I know things are going my way. I owe this all to so-and-so or such and such. Now, I remember when I was first uh, teaching, I was starting to write students' letters of recommendation. And they couldn't believe it when the things that they were applying for went their way. 
you know, they were just like, they come up to me and they go, oh my God, thank you so much for it. As if I did anything, they wouldn't want to give me gifts. And I said, this is not how this works. Do not give me gifts. I don't want gifts. I'm not doing this for gifts. But you know what they were missing as they were so grateful for me? If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have written them that letter of recommendation. You know, they just overlooked that right away. It was all because of me. I have so-and-so to thank for this. So we're still packaging those out you know, our reality out in a way that there's me and this stuff is happening to me. It's same thing with the bad stuff. What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? That's a tough one when it gets really hard. Or this isn't my fault. This is not my fault. And when we think that way, perhaps we feel it's not our responsibility to take care of the moment it's showing up. I didn't do this. It's not my fault. I don't have to take care of this. Meanwhile, we're sitting in the mess that we don't think we have to take care of. And it can go on and on like this with stuff arising that we like or dislike, that we blame or that we praise. Sometimes it's what I did. Sometimes it's other things' fault, right? And so when you look at everything's coming my way, that has built into it. When it's all about me, then there's this other stuff. So everything's coming my way. The way we're constructing the world now is there's me and then there's this other stuff. And I think we can easily see that we've, when we've constructed a world that it's me and other difficulties can arise pretty quickly in that formulation. It's easy to think there's an unbridgeable gap between me and other. And then we act out of that sense that we have. But what we're overlooking then, even in the formulation that, while well, all things are coming my way, right? Seeing things in terms of me, seeing things in terms of other, is that no matter how we slice it, so no matter what dualities we cut this reality up into, here it is. It's always this. And sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it looks like that, but it's always this. And I know I've given this talk before, and you're like, Steve, you always tell us that. But I can say I've had people gratefully tell me, you're telling me I just need to come back to this, aren't you? Again. And the teachers keep telling me that's what we do. But it's so easy. The reason that I, I'm stressing this is I, I know from my own experience, I know from talking to others, I know from the situations that are arising right, that this is a difficulty for people to grab hold of the thing. Oh my God, this just happened. I can't get through this. This is terrible. Come up with whatever situation you want to. And if we start to look at what's showing up, we're looking at that situation. So just as when we look at me, there's other. When we construct the world with other, it's about me. You can't have me without the other. You can't have the other without me. But if we can really see that, if we can really see what we're doing when we slice the world up into the stuff, which is we're just making some kind of judgment we're making some, we're saying this is the way the world is right now. And then usually there's a judgment that goes along with it. But if we can see that we're doing that, then we can start to see that the world we're constructing is me and outside. And it's hard for us. Because we don't, I'd say we rarely ask the question, who am I? When we make that construction, me and other. Who am I? We don't really ask that. Maybe in really extreme circumstances. But we usually don't ask it. And I think about, uh, Steve, you were talking about, I don't remember who it was, but they were saying that uh, I know what this is until somebody asked me a question about it. Is it Augustine? Yeah. St. Augustine, yeah. I know what this is until you ask me about it. <laughs> you know? And then on one hand, it's true, it's just right here. That we don't have to do too much analysis and explanation. Right here it is. But at the same time, we have to watch it. What is here? 
when we're saying it's just this? Are we saying, well, it's just this? <laughs> you know, are we holding on to something? That again is hard. So who am I that everything, the way I read it is who am I that everything's coming my way, <laughs> right? Or more generally, who am I? And a related question to that that I've, I've raised recently in one of my classes is where am I? Where are you? It's related, where are you? That's pretty easy to answer. Pat, where are you? Here in the Zendo. All right. And uh, where's that? In Minneapolis. And where's that? In Minnesota. And where's that? In the United States. And where's that? In North America. And where's that? <laughs> Starts to get to be like that Our Town, if you remember the play Our Town, and a character, this young woman is writing like uh, her address, and she does the same thing. She just keeps opening it up. And you know where you are, is you're always here. So he could just keep going. But no matter how you situate it, no matter how big a frame you make it, you're always here. That's for sure. So when you get in your car, you'll be here. Where am I? Here. Where am I? Here. That's where you are. That's it. You can't, otherwise you can't, you can't, Whatever that is we think I am, you know, you'll hear this again at Durham Field a lot too. You can't pin it down, but you can't locate it, but it's right here. It's right here. Where am I? And where's the world? Well, it's right here. Where are you experiencing this world you think is outside? That's right here. It can't be any other place. So then people will go to that other extreme. They go, oh, there's no I. You hear these Buddhist teachings, there's no I. There's not what we're saying. Where am I? Right here. Here. And then along those lines, everything's coming my way. Well, what exactly is my way? What do we mean by that, my way? I mean, that's kind of tough. You go, I, I know what it is, but I just can't tell you what it is. It's in your lane, I guess, my way. But I don't know about you, but don't you get the feeling that you never really know where you're going? <laughs> so where is my way? My way is this way, except it's not mine. It's just this, but it feels like mine, but it's just this. So. Your way, my way, this way, any way is just this way. We take up the Buddhist way. We talk about straying from the path. You don't hear people talk about that. But where's the path? It's right here. You actually can't stray from it. Where's my way? Well, there's no other way. It's just this way. Your way, my way. Anyway, every way. The way is right now. The way is right here. And it can't be any other. It'll feel like it sometimes. It'll really feel like it. And again, I know I, I know you've heard me give this talk before, but it really does feel like it. And I'll hear people talk and they'll feel like I'm I'm lost. I'm off the way. And I just want to tap you back and go, you're not lost. Right here, you're right here, right here. And that gets us back to everything's coming my way, right? That idea that we want everything to come our way. Just remember, we can't have everything because everything is here. You can't have everything because everything is here. Where would you put it? So, it's my talk this morning. If uh, people have comments or questions, I, I invite it. I, like I said, I know you've heard it before, so it may be you just have uh, observation from your own life that you'd like to share with us or anything.
Yeah, Catherine. When you, you know, oh, thank you. When we say uh, everything's going my way, um, I'm trying to think what I was going to ask you, <laughs> but uh, the, it's not just that we're directing the way or accepting the way we're living our life that everything is going great. Um, how did, I mean, I've become more aware of the fact that I just, in acceptance of what's going on around me, yeah. I don't get so freaked out anymore. And uh, I can accept that there's a solution somewhere in here and maybe it's made it easier. I mean, getting some clarity around that. I mean, listening to this talk helps clarify just being here, but um, especially with the humor added in, that was very helpful. But it's kind of like, is are you talking about selfishness? This, you know, the, the ego thing, the selfishness that we get conditioned to, to think, oh, it's gotta be this way or no way kind of thing. Well, it can certainly turn into that. And you're right, I am talking about selfishness. I'm right? talking about seeing things in terms of me and others. So that's the way I'm thinking of selfishness. Um, and then, yeah, it can turn into, well, it's gotta be this way or no other way or, it, you know. Um, but what I've, I'm hoping also to help us to see is that when we see the world and we construct it as stuff that's happening outside, that seems to be happening to me, then it, it could become very hard, I think, sometimes for us to accept that because it's not me. So getting back to that selfishness that really can't be any other way than the way I want it, you know, it kind of shows up that way, like, oh my God, I can't, this is just too much. And, and it does, life does show up that way for us. It really does. We're just, circumstances are showing up, we're going, oh, this is, this is a lot. And it can be personal stuff that's going on. It can be political stuff that's going on. It can be, you know, whatever. And what I'm encouraging us to see is that the difficulty that we're encountering right there, and that difficulty itself is real. We're feeling it, right? So it's right there. But that is arising from this sense that we're thinking that this is kind of coming at us rather than just seeing that sort of along the lines of what you were saying, just accepting things as they are or as they're showing up which is hard for us to do. So uh, uh, in that conversation that I had last night, that's, that's what kind of came up. The person was going, so wait a minute, you're saying that if a bad thing happens, it's not really bad. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> and I said, well, no, because we will evaluate it, good or bad, right? So at, at that level, it's gonna show up as good or bad, but it, it's inherently not, it's not, like truly good or bad, if that makes sense. Try not to use some well-worn phrases we have, but the way that we would take it is be, this is just the way it is and it's good or bad, but to get past that. And getting past that is to uh, start to realize that that separation that we're initially making between the stuff that's happening to me and me is not really the full picture again. It's just the way we have of understanding because really what's happening is this, life is showing up and then we package it into me and stuff that's happening to me. And it becomes harder for us to accept, to really let in what's happening when that's the way we construct it. It becomes much easier to think, I just close the door on that, right? Or there's some place else for me to go. And this is one of the things we have a sashin coming up so for people who are interested in Sashin, I, I recommend thinking about sitting Sashin. This is one of the things Sashin actually helps us to see. Is a, Sashin is a meditation, a prolonged meditation practice. So they usually, for Dharma field, they'll go on anywhere from, well, we actually have them all ranges, but they'll go like two to five days. We have a five day coming up. And what'll happen is you'll come in with ideas you being anyone, <laughs> and then you sit session and you hang on to these ideas and you hang on to the ideas. And the idea might be, for example, this is sort of a general one, like um, I 
uh, I don't like pain. I mean, might put it that way. Like, like pain is something I don't like. And I do everything I can to avoid experiencing pain. So you come to a session and maybe you start experiencing pain. I know when I started, that was true. It was partly because I just didn't know how to sit on a cushion yet. So it really hurt. <laughs> and, you know, I was in a two-day session and by noon that first day, I thought, I got another day and a half to go. I just think this is impossible. I can't possibly do this. Right. And so then I kept thinking about how I could get out of the session. I said, well, if I tell somebody that I have a sick aunt or something like that, then I can just get out of here. I knew I'd never be able to come back to, to Dharma Field again if I did that, because I'd be so ashamed. But I really was trying to think, what excuse can I come up with to get out of here? Right. There's that door that's open. There's, there's a world that's outside. We're not realizing that the suffering really isn't in the pain. Pain is something that shows up in life. And yeah, I'm, again, I'm not saying, well, now enjoy pain or be indifferent to pain. But what I am saying is that when you start to resist it, when you're in a session, whatever it is that you're hanging on to, there's all kinds of ideas that you, you're you just carrying around with you. You come to a session, you're going to look right at that. And at some point, you're going to be like, enough. <laughs> you just put it down. So what did I do when I couldn't? I can't make it through this session. Well, first of all, there were chairs in the meditation hall. I was sitting on a cushion. I just, when, when it was time for me to be able to sit on a chair, I just sat on a chair. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there was this, like, I have to sit on the floor. That's the way you meditate. You don't sit on the chair. When you sit on the chair, you're, all those are ideas. And are ideas that were making, helping me suffer. And again, that's what, when we construct stuff that's happening to me outside, we think there's an escape. We don't realize it's just this. There's, there's no escape to this. Whatever it is, it's showing up. And so this is what we're responsible for. And again, it doesn't mean we don't take an action then, perhaps, and sit in a chair. But you know what I let go of was all of the right way to do this, wrong way to do this, I'm never going to make it. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I, all that just got exhausting to hold on to. And that's one thing Sishin can help you with, is to help you see what you're carrying with you and get to that point where you set it down. You just let it go. It's freeing. It sounds exhausting, but it's freeing. The example that I've given before that I think people can respond to, it maybe sounds a little more upbeat, is if you're caught out in a rainstorm, you know, and those first drops start hitting you, and you don't have an umbrella because you weren't expecting it. What do you do? You start looking around for a place you can go where you're not going to get wet, right? At least that's what I do. And I'm looking around, looking around, and there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And the rain just starts coming down. And you're going, oh, no, I'm getting wet. Oh, this is terrible. I'm getting wet. And then you just relax into the wet. You just go, I'm wet. All right, no problem. I'm wet. You know, it's, it's sort of same, that same sort of thing. You're releasing yourself into what's showing up. So where are you right here and what's showing up? There's no outside. So it was kind of a long-winded answer, but I appreciated the question. I think it was very good. So, yeah. I promise I won't be so long-winded if anyone has anything else they want to add. That problem. And we're doing this so our Zoom folks can hear us. Thank you for your talk today. Uh, I think one way people may define my way is through expectations and expectation setting um because they so dictate how we experience the situation our expectations of that and so i'd just be curious what healthy expectation setting if there is such a thing i'd, I'd like to hear you talk about that yeah. is it like everything is here and everything will be or, or something like that that's yeah, another good question. So, yeah, expectations, just sort of what how we expect a, a, a situation to be is, uh, it's just all it is, right? It's just like a, a notion we have of uh, how things might go. And maybe we can do things to try to help bring that about or whatever. But uh, we don't want to hang on to that. We don't want to grip that too lightly about what we expect things are like. Um, because if we grip them too tightly, our expectations become our sense of what's really supposed to happen. Then 
when it doesn't go that way, as you would surmise, then we have problems. So it's to, to uh, treat that lightly, to understand that this is just an idea I have about how things might go. Because I don't know about you, but often enough, <laughs> my expectations are, they're either like, here's the thing and then here, like my expectation and then here's the actual thing, or it's, <laughs> it's like this, rarely are they spot on. And I remember when I was uh, first seeing a therapist actually, and he asked me about something like, well, the things go the way that you think they're gonna go. And I just, I thought about it. And I, I was actually gonna say, well, sometimes and I just, I thought about it some more and I went, well, hardly ever, <laughs> you know, and that should be helpful for us too, to see that even that little slightest discrepancy helps us to see that, well, you can have expectations. Expectations are expectations, right? But just realize that's what they are and reality may not in any way whatsoever meet them and then just be flexible and be with be with what showed up instead. Yeah. Be willing to be okay getting wet. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mary. Thank you. Get my steps in. Thank you. <laughs> You're so diligent. So uh, this is more of a comment and observation. I was at work the other day and I work in this enormous space, gigantic, it's new, we move there. And um, it's a hard place to get to, it's in downtown St. Paul. But I was there by myself, I felt like, I knew there were some people around and I was doing my job working on these claims that I work on and I was suddenly overwhelmed with sadness and depression. I mean, just totally overwhelmed. I wanted to cry. I wanted to get the hell out of there. I wanted to call 988. <laughs> I wanted just to be free of this sense of oppression that suddenly swept over me. And then I just sat there, continued to work on what I was working on, the claim I was working on. And it just, it just lifted. And I can't explain how. I can't explain why I made no particular effort except just to continue working. And I guess you could say being present, being present to what I had to do. But then I realized, no, I don't feel absolutely desperate. I don't feel totally depressed and overwhelmed. I can just continue. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you don't feel desperate or depressed. You know, but, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is, it lifted. I can't say how. Yeah. The, the point I was making, first of all, was I'm glad you're not feeling depressed. Well, thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank um, you. But yeah, you know, what you're pointing out is absolutely right. Um, the other thing you said that was interesting. So first of all, you know, what Mary's pointing out is that the, uh, the situation that arises, it's going to change. Right? It's never the same. And uh, that's correct. So the, the stuff that arises that seems to really, what, whatever it is, a feeling that might arise, right? It's going to go away of its own accord. It doesn't really require intervention. But the other thing you said that I liked is you said, I can't say how. You know, I could not. How it did it. Yeah. But I do think that what you were talking about, what happens is um, there's, instability in all of this instability in the extent that I just I said to David this morning maybe truly understanding that nothing holds still that if, that this is just flux and flow and change that's really what liberation is yeah to really see that yeah to see that not and that's what happened that feeling I had did not hold still yeah. I mean you know it didn't continue to hang on. It wasn't like that rain cloud raining down on me the entire time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, teaching uh, of Shunryu Suzuki's uh, Japanese master from the 20th century that I really like is uh, not always so, not always so. And uh, the way he really hammered that teaching home is he said two words, not always so. <laughs> Yeah. He said, well, in Japanese, two words. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Daner, say question. Or is comment? It? Mary? Oh, Mary, Mary. Daner. Yeah, Mary. Hi. <clears throat> well, I was thinking about what this young man over on the right um, said uh, about how to look at things or, or what the expectations to have. And <clears throat> And also about what Mary said about having this thing wash over her coming out of nowhere and she just kept working and it went away. From my experience that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't go away and there's no tangible reason why anything, just like there was no, she couldn't put her finger on why this, this negative feeling or, you know, washed over her. She, didn't have an explanation for it. And that when that happens, the only thing that, that I learned, one of the things from Steve Hagen that I learned that has helped me a lot is trusting without explanation, <laughs> if possible, um, in what's happening. Um, because it's sort of like in other kinds of like religions and things, they, they say have faith in God or something. And uh, or belief, which belief isn't such a good word because it's believing in something without really seeing it, but trusting in what's happening, like this holistic way you're talking about when you can't see the whole. Because, you know, a lot of times if you trust in something, you want more information. You want to like, well, okay, I'll trust it because of this or that. But if you just out and out trust something, just because it's happening, then somehow, you know, the the me and the this and that and comparisons and, you know, conceptual ideas, they really drag you down. And instead, if you just trust it, just because it's happening, um, then it just, it's freeing. I'm not saying that it's easy to do, but it, it's at least it's something to remember to like hang, kind of hang on to. Um, this is just coming up and it kind of assumes that there is a benevolent, although not, although objective totality, in other words, not, you know, framing it up like this and that. So that's just something to remember. Like if it's happening, well, it's, it's maybe not, you can't say it's really supposed to happen. It just is happening. Yeah. And then, it may not go away and there may not be an explanation for it, but the, everything is impermanent, like you said. And so probably it will, um, but we can't control that, although we can try. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. I yeah, appreciate that, Mary. There's a, a lot there. So I don't know <laughs> uh, really what to respond to, except to say, yeah, there's uh, a lot of what you said is, um, is right. Uh, and yeah, so having no expectation when we go into a situation is to not be caught by our expectations. And I think it's hard for us not to have any, but if you cannot interject them, if you can try to just approach a situation without expectation, great. But if you've got expectation to realize that the expectation is just your expectation is also to not have expectation because you don't have it. You're not hanging on to it. Just something that's showing up. And move into the situation and and live it as it is. Yeah, it was one of the things you said was about you know things show up and you don't really have any explanation for it. That's really the way it always is. It's just that sometimes we come up with explanations and they seem like they work. <laughs> so we go, okay, that explanation seemed to work, um, but the reality really is we don't know the whole picture as you're saying. You know about totality is that from our limited perspective of the individual that we seem to be occupying, right? We don't know everything intellectually. We know all we need to know. Again, that's that trusting what's here. We, we know what we need to know. When you get wet, you're wet. You know what I mean? When you're, well, you know, whatever it is, we, we can just know from experience. That's knowing, that is knowing. That is a knowing that's irrefutable. But we, that intellectual knowing, will never be able to wrap our brains around everything that's going on. So any explanation we come up with is more like a theory that we have. Yeah. 
a kind of a guess or a, a narration. So, but anyhow, thank you for your comments, Marie. Those are great. Any other observations or questions or? So yeah, I, again, I, I gave this talk just because I know these are difficult things for us. These are things that we work with. This is what our practice is about, is just seeing when we're holding on to our realistic ideas. It's really seeing that. So maybe you can only hear that so often, I don't know. But I know when I started practicing, I would hear the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. And at one point, suddenly, it was as if it went from being a thing a teacher was saying. And maybe when they first said it, I went, yes. And then after all, I was like, I get it, I get it, I get it. And then it turned into, wait, they're talking to me. <laughs> I remember that happening with some talks that Norm would get. I'd be like, Norm is like, is he reading my mail right now? <laughs> he seems to know exactly what's on my mind, you know? So anyhow, so forgive my repetitiveness, but I do think that this stuff gets at to, you know, it gets at the stuff that in our daily life we really are working with. Right? That's where our practice is, so. Thank you all. <laughs>